the other way. Okay, is that clear? So it's sort of like asking which side of this line is, is C? That's really what you're asking. Is that clear? Good? Are we good? Okay, so that's question number two. And then the third question is, I give you two line segments, AB and CD. So I give you, I'm telling you this is A, this is B, this is C, this is D. And I'm asking the question, does a line segment AB intersect line segment CD? In this case, AB looks like this, CD looks like that, and it doesn't intersect. If D had been here, then they do intersect. And in which case, you may or may not want to find the point of intersection. That's less important. Here, we are simply asking the question, or do they intersect? Okay. We're going to try and solve all three problems. And what is really interesting is that all three problems are closely related, which is kind of weird because one is about vectors, the other is about driving, and the third is about line intersections. Okay. So even though they don't look very related, the question is how or what kind of approach do we use to to understand this. Is that so far good? Yeah. All right. So let's look at the first problem. And it turns out in order to solve all three problems, we're going to use something called vector algebra, which you may have been exposed to back in high school. And you probably tried very hard to forget it, because it was just horrible stuff. right? And uh, part of the problem is that, is that vector algebra, it's sort of like many of these strange things that you learn in high school. You Nobody really tells you what they're good for. And, and you do things like matrices. I mean, matrix, matrix multiplication, you know, strange stuff. Nobody seems to care what exactly it's there for. You just do them because that's what you're told. Uh, so we're going to actually see how vectors become quite valuable in understanding these problems. Okay? So let's look at something called cross products. Uh, and it turns out that we can define this problem in terms of cross product. By the way, what problem are we solving? We are solving this problem, this first guy, where we have AB and AC. And we're asking the question, is it clockwise or counterclockwise of, of the other one, right? Uh, with respect to AC, is AB clockwise or counterclockwise? That was the question, right? So we're going to now, uh, we're going to define some, uh, the cross product, which you did learn maybe. I'm sure you've all learned this at some point, right? You've all seen this in school somewhere, right? <coughs> if I tell you that the vector P1 goes from A to B, and vector P2 goes from A to C, and A is the origin, then it turns out that the cross product, or the <coughs> Uh, well, actually, the cross product is really a vector product, so it should have been a vector. And so uh, any vector has magnitude and direction, right? And what this says is that the direction is simply the sign of some number. So I'm going to give you a number, and that number, if it's positive, it'll give you one cross product, and if it's negative, it'll give you the other direction. And the, air, the cross product magnitude is actually just the area of the parallelogram that you see up there. See that shaded area? That area there is the cross product. And I, I can more or less bet you that you probably were never told this when you, when you learned about cross products. Or if you did, you probably forgot it. Uh, but that's a critical, critical piece of information in understanding cross products, it turns out. And what is also useful is that the sign of this area is either plus or minus. And depending on that, the direction, uh, the, the direction of the vector is different. And that direction is determined by what? Anyone remember this? Uh, but what does it depend on? When is it clockwise and when is it counterclockwise? Uh, or it's positive. Uh, 
Hold on a second. Well, you're telling me the answer to that problem. Don't, don't even think about that other problem. I'm asking, what does the cross product look like? What is that vector? Well, what is its direction? Sorry? P1 plus P2. No, it's not. You're asking the direction of the cross product? Yeah. Perpendicular to the plane? <laughs> yeah. So cross product is a vector that's perpendicular to the plane on which those two vectors are. Okay. Now, the problem is that there are only two possible directions. One is out of the plane or into the plane. Okay. And that's determined by the sign. Now, when is it coming out of the, when is it positive and when is it negative? Or when is it out of the plane and when is it into the plane? This is determined by what? By something called the right hand rule. Right. Okay. Now what is the right hand rule? If you are going to do P1 cross P2, you, uh, you curl your fingers going from P1 to P2. And when you do that, wherever your thumb is pointing, that's the direction of the product. So if I go from P1 to P2, my thumb is pointing out of the plane, so, it's, so the cross product is going to come out of the plane. If on the other hand, if I do P2 cross P1, that's going to go from here to here, and your thumb is going to point into the plane. We'll call, arbitrarily we'll call one of them as positive and one of them as negative. It really doesn't matter so much, it turns out, but you know, the textbooks will give you a certain direction and, and we'll just follow that. In fact, if you take x and y, the z direction is typically the cross product of x and y. So in this case, x is here and y is here, so you're going to have z coming out of the plane. And so it'll be positive z along the, along the axis coming out of the plane. So we'll call p1 cross p2 to be positive, p2 cross p1 to be negative. Clear? So these are basic things that vector algebra vector uh, algebra tells us and it turns out to be quite useful because your two questions whether the vector p2 is is clockwise of p1 or whether it is counterclockwise it turns out to be a simple question of the direction of the cross product all right so if i know how to compute the cross product I would also get the direction because it, it's, a, it's a signed vector and that should tell me whether it's coming out of the plane or into the plane. Using that I should be able to figure out whether one is clockwise of the other. So I am multiplying P1 cross P2 what this tells me is that it will come out of the plane if going from P1 to P2, I have to go counterclockwise. So if P2 is counterclockwise of P1, the cross product will be positive. This is what I need to know. So if P2 is counterclockwise of P1, then P1 cross P2 is positive. Okay, this is all I need to know. So the next thing we're going to do is figure out how we're going to compute the cross product. That's all I need to tell you. The rest is done. You're okay with this so far? All right, so how do we compute the cross product? Well, it turns out the cross product, you can actually compute the magnitude of the cross product in a very easy way. Unfortunately, that doesn't quite help us because it doesn't tell us the direction. So, if I want to do P1 cross P2, by the way, we are assuming that both these vectors are coming from the origin. Okay? If I'm going to do P1 cross P2, it turns out that it's just a simple uh, uh, computation. By the way, this is just the determinant of the 2D 2, 2 by 2 matrix. Yeah, you remember this strange stuff from your high school? Yeah. So if I write, it's the matrix x1, y1, <coughs> x2, y2, 
if I take this matrix and take its determinant, the determinant is simply x1, y2 minus x2, y1, right? You remember this. That's what you see here. So well, all this tells you is that if I have the coordinates of p1 and p2 and I plug them in here, I can figure out the cross product in a simple way. In fact, I can co compute the area of the parallelogram. Okay, so we've done several problems here already. We figured out the area of the parallelogram by simply doing this. We figured out uh, that if we know how to compute the cross product and its, and its direction, we can figure out the sign quite easily. And all I care about is the sign in order to answer that first question, which asked whether AB is clockwise of, of AC. Right? Yeah. Um, you said that it has to be from the origin? In this, in this example, yeah. it doesn't necessarily have to be for other, uh, the, the original problem is from A, the two vectors were from A, so they don't have to be from the origin, but I'll show you a simple trick for how to take care of it when it's not from the origin. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so far so good? All right. Uh, so yeah, this I already told you, P1 cross P2 is, has a direction that's perpendicular to both P1 and P2, and the only way you can do that is if it's coming out of the board or into the board, right? There is no other way to make, remember P1 cross P2 always is going to be perpendicular to both P1 and P2, okay? And if P1 and P2 are sitting on the, on the, on the board, P1 cross P2 either has to come out or go in, okay? That's, that's just how it is. And remember, cross product always gives you a vector product. The answer is always a vector. The magnitude is given by this. The sign is given by the right-hand rule. Okay. So, so here, you, even if you don't know the magnitude from here, you can simply use the right-hand rule to figure this out. And uh, uh, but uh, to get to to get the uh, to to write a program to figure out the right hand rule is somewhat annoying. Uh, it's not clear how you do this. We may have to think about this a little bit more. So far, so good. All right. So uh, so let me answer Ricky's question. What if our vectors are not from the origin? So there is a simple way to take care of the case when the vectors are not from the origin. Here is the origin, and here's my point A, and my two vectors I'm looking at, AB and AC, are from A, not from the origin. Okay, so, uh, so here is how it goes. It turns out that this vector A can be written as the sum of two vectors that, that, have, that, that go through the origin. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to draw this vector. I'm going to draw this vector. And I'm going to draw this vector. All right. So now you'll see that we have A, B, and A, C. Here's the origin, right? So uh, now you use vector additions to, to write this down. So vector from zero, from the origin to A, plus the uh, uh, vector from A to B gives you the vector from zero to, from origin to B. This is just vector algebra, simple, right? So therefore, the vector AB is simply, is, let me write that here, vector AB is simply the vector from uh, origin to B minus the vector from origin to A. That's it. That's all you need, and you can figure this out. Okay? I can do the same thing for AC, and so if I don't have things from the origin, this is what I do to fix them. Okay? And so now I'll have two different vectors. I will do exactly the same thing as before. I'll plug it in and check the determinant of the matrix and, and everything will be, and it'll give me the cross product. Okay? OK. 
Okay. So, so we still haven't quite figured out how to do clockwise versus anticlockwise. There's still a little bit of thing left because we don't know how to implement the, the right hand rule in, the, uh, in, in a computer, how to write the algorithm for it. And this pretty much tells you how to do this. So imagine instead of, well, this is from the book, so they've used different notation, P0, P1, and P2. We'll put A, B, and C instead, okay? So think of P0 as A, P1 as B, and P2 as, as C. And what you'll see here is, remember I told you, P1 minus P0, so if you take the point P1, and if you subtract the coordinates of P0, then uh, you will essentially you'll get the vector from, uh, remember, in order to get a b vector, I take the vector from the origin to b, so that's the coordinates of the destination minus the coordinates of the, of the source. And if you do that subtraction, it'll give you the, the vector from A to B, right? Hey, Demba. And similar things over here. You're looking at P0 to P1. P0 to P1 is the same as taking the coordinates of P1 and subtracting the coordinates of P0, right? So think of this as a vector subtraction, right? And you're doing cross product with P0, P2, which is the vector subtraction of P2 minus P0. Right? So if you do this vector product, you will see that it gives you this, slightly more complicated than before, because P1 minus P0, this is the x coordinate of this, of this difference, which is simply x1 minus x0, whereas here you'll see the y coordinate, the difference of the y coordinates, y1 minus y0 which is exactly what we wrote earlier. If you see over here, we said x1, y2 minus x2, y1, and here everything came from the origin. The origin has x coordinate and y coordinate to be zero, right? But now, instead of x1, I have to put x1 minus x0, where x0 is the x coordinate of p0, okay? That's all we did. So instead of x1, think of x1 minus x0. Th instead of y1, think of y1 minus y0 instead of x2. So all I'm going to do is that's all I did. That's to simply consider the case when it's not going from the origin. And now if I take this matrix and I find its determinant, and that's it. Uh, now I have to check whether it's positive or negative, and essentially that's the same as computing that value and checking whether it's greater than zero or less than zero. Okay. So in order to figure out whether it's clockwise or counterclockwise from P1 to P2, okay. I, all we are doing is a simple calculation involving these eight numbers and checking whether that, that, prod, that, so that quantity is positive or negative. Okay? So in order to check whether this quantity is positive or negative, it's the same as saying, is this greater than this or, or smaller than this? So in terms of precision arithmetic, it's going to be very, very accurate, rather than trying to find uh, uh, there are, by the way, there are many, many other ways to do this pro same problem of finding whether it's clockwise or counterclockwise, uh, because it's really the same as asking, is it to the left of this line or to the right of this line? Okay, and that is actually quite complicated because you have to find some intersections and, and you have to actually find coordinates of the lines and, and all that will give you, give rise to very imprecise arithmetic and you can easily make mistakes if the, if the points are very, very close to the line. Is that clear? Is there any like, theorem or something proved behind this that is positive that's 
I just proved everything to you. You, you saw the complete proof because I told you that uh, I, I, you know what the definition of cross product is. From the definition of cross product, we said that the, if the cross product is, is positive, then it's going to come out of the plane. If it's negative, it's going to go into the plane. And I also showed to you why, uh, uh, how the, the determinant of the matrix gives you the cross product. And then we also know that this determinant can be positive or negative, and depending on whether it's positive or negative, it gives you the direction of the, of the cross product. So all the pieces are there already. No, but when I put this in, into the programming world, so yeah. then it's going to be the positive coordinate. That's right. So this is exactly the same as this determinant. If you're convinced that this determinant gives you the answer, then this is no different. This is just the value of that determinant. Because x1 minus x0 times y2 minus y0, that's what you see here as the first term, minus this times this, that's the second term. I didn't do anything different here, right? So you have the entire proof. You just have to put all the pieces together, right? You start by saying, if you are given two vectors, their cross product looks like this. If the cross product is positive, then uh, these two, then P1 to P2 is going to be counterclockwise, in which case the cross product comes out of the, of the, of the board. This is all you need to know. You, you, you had a question. What if it's zero? Yeah, we'll get to that in, in a second. Very good question, yeah. Is it, is it possible to use this like in, in like three dimensions, like we have x, y? Yeah, all of this works in any dimensions, it turns out. Uh, but of course, there is no such thing as left turn and right turn in three dimensions. Uh, because you're going in space, you're going this way, and, and who knows, you're turning some, some strange direction. Is that, is that left turn or right turn? I have no idea. Uh, so this works. Uh, it's easier to imagine this in the world of 2D because you can imagine yourself driving a car. It's not so easy in 3D, but it will give you an answer, and it will give you the only problem is that in the 3D world, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's unclear how this thing pans out. Th there, are, there are some issues with it, uh, but it's still possible. The, the answers are still going to be correct. It's going to give you a reasonable answer. It's just that the plane on which those two vectors lie, that's the plane that you're really thinking about. So, so if, I am, if I'm going from here to, let's say, this camera, and then from the camera I turn to, to, your, to you, is that a left turn or a right turn? I don't know. Well, but if I put these two vectors on the same plane, which is this plane, then on that plane there is a clear answer and that's the same answer, right? So it works in 3D perfectly, perfectly fine. It's just that all your coordinates now are not 2D coordinates, they're 3D coordinates, so it's a little bit messier trying to do the cross product. You had a question. No? Okay. So your question was what happens if it is? If, if it's neither left turn nor a right turn. So if all three points lie on the same line, then what happens? Well, in that case, what do you expect to the cross product? It will be zero. zero. So if, the, if these two quantities, if these two products are the same, then it's going to be zero, in which case you don't do a turn. Well, you may do a 180 degree turn, but it's, it's still a collinear but it's neither a right turn nor a left turn. And so there are actually three possible answers. What does this do? I'm not really sure uh, if it's zero. Uh, you, you may have to, depending on what your application is, you may have to massage it appropriately. Clear? So, so far, this is great. We have solved the first problem that says if I'm given two vectors, is one of them counterclockwise of the other? This simple question, we answer this using vector algebra right from scratch. Okay, and the simplest thing to do is to do the cross product, and at least in 2D, the cross product is a simple determinant of a matrix, and the, the, the values that you put in the determinant are simply the difference in x coordinates, difference in y coordinates of the first vector, difference in x-coordinates and the difference in y-coordinates of the second vector. That's all it is. So this is the first vector, second vector, make up your matrix, 
find its determinant and find its find its sign okay so very very simple vector algebra converted into uh, it's easy to turn this into code because you know all these values clear so if I gave you the points, you should be able to figure out the answer to that first question. So we are now ready for the second question. The second question asks, if I'm going, I'm driving from A to B and then I'm turning to C. Is that thing a left turn or not? Okay. In this case, it is not. But if C were somewhere here, it would be a left turn. The answer would be yes. So you're supposed to write a program that does that for you. Okay, everyone clear about the question? So it turns out that this looks like a driving test, but you can turn it into vectors and, it, and you can solve it exactly the way you solved the previous problem. Okay, how do we do that? Uh, how do we turn this problem into that problem? What are my two vectors for which I'm going to ask the question? A, B, and uh, you, you, yeah. Should you do A, B, and A, C, or should you do A, B, and B, C? What, what, what should we do? Uh, a, B, and B, C. But then you, you're not exactly asking the same question. Your first, first uh, uh, point is not the same. You would like A, B, and A, C. Uh, well, so uh, what we need is, a, is, a, is something that says the answer to this is yes if the answer to that is counterclockwise or something like that, right? So, so we have to find that correspondence and, and you're probably convinced that, that there is a correspondence, right? There is a clear link, you're, you're convinced of this, correct? So, so now it's just a matter of figuring out what are the vectors and, and what answer should it correspond to. That's all we have to figure out. And it turns out to be quite simple if you sit with it. Uh, if, you're, if you haven't already figured out, if you sit with it for two, three minutes, you'll figure this out. We know that left turn test is, uh, a left turn is very, very connected to a counterclockwise turn. So let's assume that P0 is the origin and you drive from P0 to P1. So that's, let's say, going from A to B. And then if I'm doing a left turn, this is the same as going counterclockwise because your thumb will point out of the, out of the board, right? The right-hand rule will tell you out of the board. So what we're going to say is a left turn is equivalent to a counterclockwise positioning of the second vector. That's all we have to know, and it turns out that the rest is pretty straightforward. And again, we'll have questions about what happens if they're collinear, things of that sort. Those issues have to be sorted out, and you'll see that in that case, uh, the same problem uh, that we had in the, in the previous question will, will turn up here as well. Okay, so I don't know if I have a slide here. Yeah, so here it says, uh, remember the direction problem has three has uh, three points, right? I'm driving from this point to this point and then I'm turning here and I'm asking the question, is it a left turn or a right turn? Whereas the, uh, yeah, uh, well, uh, uh, here I'm saying that this direction, if this direction is, is counterclockwise, then the answer that I will get by plugging it in here is gonna be positive and the left turn answer is gonna be true. Okay, this is the correspondence you're going to need. But of course, here, the two vectors that you're going to need is going from PI to PJ and PI to PK. Okay. I know the notation here is kind of confusing, but uh, I'm hoping that you got the idea. Is that clear? Some of it you may have to work out and, and convince yourself, but, it's, but the pieces are all here. What can I explain? So the notation is PI to PJ and then PI to PK. 
the direction question is a driving from PI to PJ and then going to PK. The uh, left turn also is the same question. Except that here you're going to get clockwise or counterclockwise. Here you're going to get a turn. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, so also the direction question, uh, you really have to write two vectors. The, f the direction question has to come with two vectors, and that's not nicely written here. I think I, I, I should write it differently. Uh, so I don't have a, do you have a eraser? Thank you. Thank you. So uh, let me rewrite that for you and say that uh, I'm going to ask the direction question. The direction question is AC and AB. If I have something like that, I'm asking the question, is AB counterclockwise of AC? Okay. So this is the same as asking, is AB counterclockwise of AC? What I'm saying here is that this is same as a left turn test that says I drive from A to C and then go to B. Is that a left turn? Okay. So this is the same as a left turn test where I go from A to C then to B. These two are the same. You believe it? Everything okay here? Yeah. So therefore, it's pretty much the same code. I just have to interpret it differently. Good? You walked in late. The, is this still okay? You're trying to follow. Okay. Uh, so we're asking the question, is this vector clockwise of this? Or do we have to turn counterclockwise in order to go from this vector to this vector? We're saying that's the same as a driving question where I first, where I drive from A to C. Well, uh, yeah, I, I messed it up with the notations here. <laughs> uh, so let me change this notation and confuse you a little more. Um, yeah, the way I had it framed, let me look at the question again. Yeah, so it says, Given two vectors, A, B, and A, C, is A, B, counter, is, is a, B clockwise from A, C? OK. Uh, yeah, everything was different here. Is, is A, B clockwise of A, C? That's really the question, right? Yeah. Uh, that's the same as if A, B is clockwise of A, C, then it's going to go into the board. So I, I would rather do A, C times A, B, yeah. So then uh, I, would, uh, I would ask the question, is AB clockwise of AC? I'm going to ask it this way. And instead, I'm going to ask the question, is AB uh, uh, counterclockwise of AC? Sorry, no, 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 I take that back. Is, is, uh, is AC counterclockwise of AB, of AB, yeah? And it turns out these two questions, are the same as this left turn test, where if I'm driving from A to, now to B to C, yeah. Yeah, yeah now I have to go to from B to C, yes. Yeah. Both questions should, should is, is dealt with in exactly the same way. You, you have exactly the same code. You're gonna plug in the coordinates of A, B, and C up in the same way, and the way you're gonna do this is by, is by doing it here. So x1 and y1 are the, sorry, x0 and y0 are your start points, right? x1 and y1 are your midpoints, the, the second point, and x2 and y2 are your final destination. I think I got it right, I hope. You guys should really test, check it out. Yeah, it makes sense because uh, we have to first <coughs> check from the origin to the last point. Yeah. Second. 
that's right. Yeah, that's right. Correct. Yeah. Okay. So that brings us to the third question, which is the perhaps the uh, hardest and, and, and perhaps the most interesting one. Sorry? Okay. You said something. What did you say? Okay, good. So you're ready for the third problem. Okay, we are ready for the third problem. The third problem is, has nothing to do with vectors, has nothing to do with driving. It, you got, you're given two, in, two segments, line segments, and you're asked the question, do these two things intersect? Okay, now the problem is, if I were to actually, I can write the code, it turns out it's not that difficult, okay? Um, if you know enough coordinate geometry, you can, you, can, you can work this out from scratch. So I'm given two line segments. Here is AB, here is AC, uh, sorry, here is CD. Uh, uh, I know that uh, if I consider the infinite lines through these line segments, I can write the, if I have two points, I can write the equation of this line. So I can write down the equation of this line and I can write the equation of this line. Then I can do simultaneous, uh, I can solve them simultaneously and find the intersection point. And then what do I do? Just find the I already have the intersection point. It's just that if, the, if, this, if this line went here, the point of intersection would not be on the other line segment, right? So the point of intersection needs to be on both the line segments and then you know that they would intersect. Does that make sense? It's just that going through all these steps is really, really annoying and you have to write all the code for solving two simultaneous equations and then checking whether it's on, on, the, other, uh, on the other line segment between A and B, all that is, is annoyingly complicated, okay? And then you have to take care of the case when when they are parallel, when they are not intersecting, blah, 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 all right? That's, those are all the issues that you have to deal with. There's all possible special cases to work out, okay? We're going to solve this problem using some of the things we've learned today. How do I do that? So we call it the segment intersection test. Can we find the whether it's uh, clockwise or counterclockwise with uh, both the lines and uh, if uh, we got the... Uh, <laughs> wait, 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 wait. So uh, let me erase this and redraw it, okay? So just for the sake of argument, let's say that they are so there are really two possible cases. One is A, B, and C, D intersects, and the other is when A, B, and C, D don't intersect. I don't know, we'll draw it some, something like this. Yeah, so here's A, B, here's C, D. So, so uh, what is your idea now? If you can repeat it, then I can start to make sense. Do you consider first case? Yeah. A, B, and C, D? Yeah. If we find whether uh, We found, we find, we find for D whether uh, D is left or right with respect to AB, and we find for C also whether C is left or right in respect to AB. Okay. If both are different, then we can say that they're intersecting. We can uh, cross check okay. by... Okay, hold on a second. So let me see if, if, this, if that idea made any sense to anybody. Right. Did this make sense? Right. Hold on a second. Uh, did this make sense? Now, I'm not asking whether, whether there's a flaw in that. I'm asking if, the, if this made sense. It did not. Uh, uh, you want to repeat that a little bit so that people understand it first before we figure out if there is a problem with it? Uh, so to consider for first case, we have line AB and we need to find whether it's intersecting with CD. So we consider uh, D and we find whether D is uh, Counterclockwise or clockwise? Suppose it's clockwise. Wait, wait, but for counterclockwise and clockwise test, I need two vectors. What are my two vectors that you're, you're comparing for clockwise and counterclockwise? Uh, AB and uh, AB and CD. <laughs> what are my two vectors? AB and AC. 
Um, so you're suggesting you're suggesting A B and A D or A B. You're doing something like that? Mm. And AB and AC, right? Wait, so let him finish. Let him uh, hold on just a second. Let me make sure that everyone understands what he's saying. And then AB and C. Well, wait, you, so what do I do with yeah. these two vectors? Explain to uh, people. So we have AB, AB and AD. Uh -huh. And whether it's uh, counterclockwise or clockwise. Okay. So in this case, it's uh, clockwise. Uh, because it went this way. Yeah. From AB to AD, you're checking whether it's clockwise. Okay, then. And I will check for uh, whether from AB to AC what it does. Now you're going to check this. Yeah. And you find that going from AB to AC yeah. is bringing so it out of the board, so yeah. it's going in the opposite direction. Yeah. Okay. So it's for both uh, from for AB, AB and AD, if it's uh, clockwise and both yeah. Then I will, uh, okay. Well, so that's useful because here A, B, and and C, D, mm. uh, both were uh, both were in this direction, right? Um, so here A, B to A, C, and A, B to C, D both went into the board. Mm. So uh, if they both go into the board or both go out of the board, then yeah. it's not going to be intersecting because they were both on one side. Does that make sense? You do, do it for both sets, right? Hold on. Hold on. I know where you're going. <laughs> Are we good? Why? What's wrong with it? Uh, why don't you hold on? So let me see if it, everyone else is happy with this. Is this going to work? Why doesn't it work? <laughs> but um, like for instance, let's say line C D yeah. actually crossed, but not in the segment of A B. What if C D sits like this? Yes. Mm. So in that case, still in that case, A B to A A D is going to go like this, and A B to C D A C is going to go like that. But still, yeah. but still, they don't intersect, and so you need this other idea that Yash has, which is do this again. For do this again for? For uh, CD and AD. Right. So uh, let's talk in terms of left turn test and right turn test because these vectors really uh, make my head dizzy. So let's let's focus on, on driving. Uh, how can I turn this into driving test questions? So I erase all this. So I'd like to solve this using left turn tests and right turn tests. Can you help me? From A B to D, whether we are which direction we are going in from Going from A to D. B to D. A to B to D. In which direction we are going in from Is it a left turn or a right turn? And, and checking from A to B to C. If they, are, yeah. if they are two different turns, then they're going to be on opposite side of the line. And so there's a good chance that they will intersect. Is that clear? Yeah. Yeah. If they're both involving a right turn or if both involve a left turn, there's no chance in hell they're going to intersect. Is that clear? So you're going from A to B to C or A to B to D. Okay, so that's your left turn test. Is that clear? So we're going to check the following. We're going to check if there's a left turn test. I'm just going to call this LTT. So LTT going from A to B to C, and left turn test going from A to B to D. So driving from A to B first to C, and then driving from A to B then to D. At B, is it a left turn? This is the question we're asking. Okay, if these two are equal, then no intersection. If these two are not equal, then possible intersection. Why is it possible intersection? Because something like this can happen. Here I'm going from A to B to C, 
and A to B to D. They gave me different turns, right? Well, I can, I can draw the CD over here if, if, if that helps you. From A to B to C is a left turn, A to B to D is a right turn. But they're not intersecting. So what went wrong? So this is where you do what, what, what people were suggesting. You do the exact same thing, but with CD as your start point. So you also have to check whether the left turn test from CD and correct. You check whether these are equal. Is that clear? Remember, the left turn test will either give you a yes or a no. It'll tell you whether it's a left turn or a right turn. Of course, we still have to deal with the case when things are collinear. So what we have done is to take this code that's fairly annoying and turn it into essentially one line of code. Okay. But it turns out because you have to deal with the degenerate cases, there is some, some special cases to deal with. And the code is not that simple as we thought, but the heart of it is just one line. Okay. Um, so here is the code. You'll see that the heart of the code is right here. And you can write this more compactly, by the way. Uh, uh, so you find the directions of each of those left turn tests, right? So the first one is a left turn test that goes from P3 to P4 to P1, P3 to P4 to P2, then P1 to P2 to P3, and P1 to P2 to P4. Okay. So there are four different left turn tests that we need, right? We compute all of those. And then the rest is just uh, if statements. The first one is the most general one that says, as long as they are different, this is less, this is greater, this is less, this is greater, this is less. Yeah, well, uh, there are four possible ways that they can be different, right? If they are different, then they are going to intersect. These, these lines will intersect. How will they not? Uh, uh, well, you also know that, the, that otherwise it's going to, be going to not intersect. There are some odd cases. The odd cases are when you have collinearity. Now, the collinearity gets messy because it's possible that one of the endpoints of the other line is on, is on the first line. Or maybe both of them are on the same line. Or maybe both of them are parallel. So all sorts of annoying things happen. And that's what this takes care of. So if one of them gives you a degenerate case, and the other one, yeah, there's a test called on segment. Um, I thought this itself takes care of this. Why do you need that? Uh, what if they are co uh, collinear, but uh, Right, right, OK, apart. good, yeah. So, so it's possible that P3 to P4 to P1, it gives you a zero, which means those three points are on the same line. But it could be that it's outside the line segment or inside the line segment. And that's what this last one takes care of. And so there are four possible cases of, of how they can be zeros. And in each case, you have to make sure that the third one is on the segment. Uh, so yeah, let's talk about on segment. In on segment, we have a segment from P1 to P2, and we're asking if this is on that segment. How do I test this? Give, us, give me the most, uh, uh, you know, it's fine if it's lengthy and, and not so efficient. What's the, what's the most reasonable way of doing it? How do I test this on segment? Remember, the on segment test says in on segment, I have three points that I'm given P1, P2, and P3. And I'm asked the question if I draw a line segment from P1 to P2, is P3 on that line segment? 
And clearly, we're only going to do this test for things that are collinear. Okay. So here is the simplest way that I would do if, if somebody just woke me up in my sleep and said, go solve this problem. I would find the equation of the line between these two points. We know how to do this, right? You're given two points. You know how to find the equation of the line. And then I would make sure that this guy is on that line. And then I would check whether the x-coordinate of this guy is between the x-coordinates of these, guys, th these two, and the y-coordinates are also between the y-coordinates of these two. Okay, that's, how, that's the silly way I would do it. Actually, you don't even need to check the check. Uh, as long as they're collinear, yeah. I only have to check the x-bounds and the y-bounds, right? Yeah, you could, you could skip that because we know, we know already that d1 is 0, so, the, so that, that, uh, that dot product, sorry, the determinant is already 0. So the three points are collinear. All we're checking is whether one point is between the other two points, right? So you can just check the x coordinates and, and figure this out. Hey, Jada. So that part is somewhat easy, and uh, you could just do it that way. You don't need anything else. So just check whether the x-coordinate of this is between the x-coordinates of these. In fact, that itself is enough if you're, if you're already collinear. You don't need to check the y. But it's possible that the x-coordinates are all the same. It's, it's parallel to the x-axis. So then you should check the y. Yeah. So yeah, the safest thing is to check both that the x-coordinate of p3 is between x-coordinates of p1 and p2, and the y-coordinate of p3 is between y-coordinates of p1 and p2. So that will check whether, whether P3 is on the segment P1, P2. Hey, you had a question? Oh, Demba. Yeah. So, um, so in order to check if it is collinear, I know we can do it using the test if it is equal to zero, if that term is zero, no, uh, can we, are we already assuming that based on? Yeah, well, this D1 equals zero simply says that, that, the, that the, the test gave you a zero. Right, yeah, correct. So we know it's collinear. We just have to make sure that this guy is between those two. Right? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. I don't know why they've written it that way. Um, maybe just to make it clear. Just in case. <laughs> yeah, why can't I just do if D1 dot D2? Well, uh, uh, if D1 equals 0. If D1 times D2 is less than 0, and if D3 times D4 is less than 0. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Sorry, you came in late. You've missed all the action. <laughs> So uh, what we have done is to solve all three problems that, we, that I promised, these three guys. And what you saw was that all of these are connected to the same left turn test. The left turn test is, if I'm driving from A to B and then to C, do I make a left turn at B or a right turn at B? That's the question. If I can solve that problem, all three are somewhat related and I can solve all three. Fine. And all three can be solved using vector algebra. And vector algebra, in particular, we're going to use something called the cross product. And in order to compute the cross product, we just solve a, a simple two by two determinant. And we compute that determinant. It's just the something minus something. And if that, if that product is negative, you get one answer. If it's positive, you get the other answer. As simple as that. Yeah. This is the uh, this is the recommended way to solve problems related to the left turn test because uh, uh, you you uh, you have the least amount of problems because of precision arithmetic. Almost any other method that you will use, you will get into trouble if you have precision issues. If I, if for instance, this point C, if I draw it very, 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 very close to this line, 
if your arithmetic is not precise enough, you could answer either way. You won't be able to tell me whether it's on this side or on the other side. That's where precision arithmetic will start to impact you. And it turns out that the method I outlined here, and that's outlined in the book, is the safest way to make sure that precision doesn't mess you up. In many of the other, other methods, you're going to do division, which brings in more precision problems. Here, all the multiplications, you just multiply two numbers, and then you check whether something is greater than or less than zero. And so uh, that's the most limited amount of precision arithmetic that you're doing. In all other versions, if you want to solve simultaneous equations, you're going to have to divide, and you don't know what kind of answers you'll get. Okay, And if the moment you do division, it, the, the level of, of errors that you, that you can possibly get in a precision arithmetic becomes much larger. And that's the reason why this method is the, is the chosen method for for this calculation. So you have, in the algorithm that she mentioned, that we uh, were product of D1 and G2, but D1 and G2 both are like true and false, right? They are numbers. They are numbers because so they are, they are, they are, they are the, the, this is the quantity that you get from so here. It, it is direction. I thought it was left. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Are we good? Okay, so now let's talk about other problems that we can solve. Uh, area of a triangle, I know we talked about this, uh, I have a couple of slides on this, uh, so let me just quickly go through them. Area of a triangle, everyone knows this, half base times height. Uh, there are other ways to solve this as well. Uh, uh, here's another one, it's A times B times sine of the angle between, between those two. Uh, by the way, generally with triangles, the, uh, the convention followed is that, uh, let me see. Yeah, in, in triangles, the convention usually followed is um, uh, a, B, and C are three sides of the triangle, and the angle between A and C is called B or beta. Uh, the angle between A and B is typically called gamma or C, and the ang this angle is called A or alpha. Uh, so the angle opposite the A is, is called A, uh, angle opposite B is called B, and so on. So you'll see that uh, that's A times B times sine of the angle between those two sides. Okay. There are also formula using S. S is the perimeter. So S is A plus B plus C. And that gives you another set of formulae. Uh, is that A plus B plus C or A plus B plus C by 2? It's A plus B plus C. Yeah, it's just a perimeter. Oh, oh perimeter. he's right. Okay, I forgot. That's what I have written here. So I didn't, uh, yeah, I'd forgotten that I wrote that. Okay. I did not remember that, yeah. Uh, yeah, also, Triangle area is, is also easily produced by going back to the cross product. Why? Because the area of the triangle, ABC, is exactly half of the parallelogram that you get by drawing parallel vectors. So you can just get the cross product. This one here, compute that cross product and take half. Good? So these are all various ways to produce this. You have to remember here that this formula here assumes that the third point is the origin. If it's not the origin, then you have to do this 
x1 minus x0 and y1 minus y0, x2 minus x0 and y1, y2 minus y0. Okay, so you have to replace each one of these by minus x0. <coughs> Are you clear about this? Did that go too fast? You're okay? All right. So these are area of the triangle, and you can connect area of the triangle to the area of the parallelogram. Very simple. Yeah. Area of a triangle can also be written as a three-dimensional, a three-by-three determinant. Uh, so if your three points are x1, y1, x2, y2, and x3, y3, then area of the triangle is this here which turns out to be the same as what you had in the other formula. No different, it's just another way of writing it. This is nicer because here you see x1, y1, x2, y2, x3, y3 somewhat clearly, and the, for the other uh, extra is just all ones. Okay? But it's a three-dimensional, uh, three by three determinant, so it's a little more work. If you write up the formula, you'll get, you'll, you'll see that it's not that different. It's exactly the same as this. Okay? So yeah, just to make sure, it's a triangle that has x1, y1, x2, y2, and x3, y3. Any questions? Oh, what's that? Not sure. Oh, R R is this rec is this rectangle yeah. minus C minus D minus E, and that's how all of that comes up. Okay, fine. Um, Okay. Wow, what kind of animation is that? <laughs> I've never had the animation bullets come last. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what about area of a polygon? Remember, a polygon is uh, uh, is a, a is an n-dimensional shape with straight line edges, right? Uh, there's this nice shoelace formula, which should remind you of the triangle area. You'll see the half again, but uh, in the triangle area, so let me just remind you of the triangle area. Uh, here's another way to write all of this. It's got x1, y2, x2, y3, x3, y1, minus x2, y1, x3, y2, x1, y3. Do you see any patterns here? Yeah. What is the pattern? So it seems that this goes from 1 to 2, this goes from 2 to 3, and this goes from 3 to 1, and it's always x, y, x, y, x, y, right? And then here again you have, instead of 1, 2, you have 2, 1, then 3, 2, and then 1, 3. I, I don't know. I, I, I'm not sure how you would remember this, but uh, one there's this. Point, another is not yeah, yeah, perhaps, yeah. So in fact, there's a picture here that, that does exactly that. Uh, so they call this the shoelace formula. And it turns out it can be extended for polygons. This is amazing because now you can take a larger polygon and just plug in the values. So the triangle one is just half of this? Three. The triangle one is a polygon with three sides. Yeah, three vertices, right? So you just take the first three. Except that I don't, I assume that this is only for convex polygons. I'm not sure if it works for general. Con 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 Does it work for other non-convex as well? The same formula works? I believe so, yeah. I think I read it somewhere. How does a convex polygon Yeah, you can. I mean, the, a, a non-convex polygon can look something like this. Oh. And that's, that's a non-convex polygon. The question is, does this can you plug it in here and get the formula? You guys should try it. I, I'm not 100% sure. For you. It works? Okay. Great. But it shouldn't be, uh, it can't be non-simple polygon. 
So you can't have, you can't have this. Uh, that's not, I'm sure that's not allowed. So you can have simple polygon that's non-convex, but you can't have sides intersecting each other. Okay. Yeah, so uh, this is another thing that's useful. I, I don't know why it's stuck here. It's stuck here because somebody asked a question, I think. That's why I have it here. Uh, uh, how much time do I have? 45. Oh, already 45? Okay, then let's stop here. Uh, yeah, we'll see this comes up in, in some other app, in another problem called the convex hull problem. Uh, convex hull is you're given a set of points and you're asked uh, what is the smallest polygon that includes all the points. Uh, a simple example comes something like this. Here are a set of points that are given to you. And you're asked, what is the smallest convex polygon that includes all the points? Is the problem clear? You want a convex polygon, and the interior of it should include all the red points. So it turns out, in order to do this, I have to be as inclusive as possible. That's my smallest convex polygon. Um, my lines don't look straight, but it is a convex polygon, believe me. You mean on the sides, on the, on the convex hull? Yeah. Uh, uh, what happens is that it depends on the algorithm you use. So uh, one of the algorithms, well, let's, uh, uh, let's look at the, one of the algorithms. One of the algorithms goes as follows. Take the point with the lowest y-coordinate. That's this guy. The point with the lowest y-coordinate will always be on the convex hull. Then start from here and, and draw a, a, a line segments to all the other points. <coughs> okay. Among all those points, pick the one with the smallest angle to the x-axis. Here's my x-axis. Remember, because this is the lowest y-coordinate, nothing is below this, right? So. I find the point with the lowest angle, smallest angle. That's where this comes up, uh, sorting the points by polar angle. Actually, <coughs> there, are, there, are, there are two algorithms for convex hull, and both of them require this. The other one requires it more. But you, can, you don't need to sort it, but still, you have to compare angles. And you find the least one. And then you, t you go there, uh, and then you redo the whole thing again. But this time, you use this as your x-axis. So now, from this point, you do all your, all your rays, and you find the one with the least angle to the x-axis, where the x-axis is the new x-axis. OK? And it turns out to be this one. Then you do the same thing from here, but this time your x-axis is that. And you find that this guy has the smallest angle because all the other angles are larger. Right? Then I go over here, because that was the last first one that I got, and I move my x-axis to there, and I will get this. Then I go here, and I do the same thing, and I will find that. OK? Now, imagine that you have two red points on the same line. Now what happens? Uh, if you have more than one point with the same polar angle that is, all, that is the smallest among all of the angles, then you find the one that's closest and, and use that first. So that's how you solve the problem with... with Why don't well, uh, 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 there may be applications where you want to point, all, point to all the points on that convex hull, in which case you want this, the nearest. Or if you just wanted the quickest answer, yeah, what you're saying is, is perfectly fine. Yeah. And like in this algorithm, you have to like, at every 
after every connection, you have to recompute that. You have to recompute all the angles to all the other points and find the smallest. This is called the gift wrapping algorithm. So you're, think of this as your sheet of paper. You've got this weird gift that you're trying to give to somebody you don't like, and you're trying to wrap this up. So you take this sheet of paper and you, you move it up, and the first point it hits is this one. Right? Clear? And then you continue to move this up, and the first point it'll hit is that. And you keep doing that until you get back to the start point, and that's when the gift is wrapped and you got the convex hull. Yeah. Like when you start from the one with the lowest y coordinate, yeah. and then you sort everything, right? Yeah. And then you choose the one. You don't have to sort, by the way. You only have to find the one with the smallest angle. But yeah, go ahead. Yeah, like I'm, I'm, if we, let's, let's say we sort them, right? Yeah. If we choose the one with the lowest, lowest polar, polar angle. Angle, right? Yeah. When we go to that one, instead of recomputing everything and so on, we can just make sure that um, the turns are right. And if the turns are right, we don't have to recount. The, the turns are going to be right, just because of the way the convex hull is built. Everything over here is going to be a left turn. It's just that this angle is the smallest for the one that's of, that's of interest. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, inst instead of like, you know, at each point where we uh -huh. calculated to choose the smallest one, but if we just calculate everything initially and keep it in a solid order, um, we can just choose the next one, which is smallest, and make sure that uh, It may not be the right, right answer. Um, the reason is the following. <coughs> uh, so uh, let's say that I have a point over here. OK. Uh, this one was next in the line. Mm -hmm. But when I went here, that's not the one that came up. Yeah, exactly. Because let's say you choose that one, and it's wrong, right? Mm -hmm. When making the next turn, yeah, so well, so now you're, you're, you're talking about a different algorithm, and that's called the Graham scan, and I can <coughs> talk about it next time. Okay. Uh, but you're absolutely right. And so there are ways to, to use turns to do that. That's called the Graham scan, and I, uh, I'd like, I'd like to, to spend some time with it. So give me a, a next time let me present it for you, okay? But you're absolutely right. Uh, so uh, you, the other algorithm does the sorting only once, and figures out everything. And I'll show you how that works. It's actually quite nice. OK? Questions? Can we stop here? <laughs>